Good morning and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together the people of God say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is June the 29th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now we're going to continue our study on the book of Galatians today. We are in chapter 1 and we will look at verse 6 through verse 10. So if you have your Bibles, open to Galatians chapter 1 and let's pick up at verse 6. Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and they would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. We said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men, or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now what we're getting into today is the thrust of this letter. We see the heartache of Paul, who is the founder of this young fellowship, i.e. church, and he's writing this letter to address a very specific problem. In verse 6, he says, I marvel, I'm amazed that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now he repeats this again in chapter three in verse three, when he says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? In chapter five, he says in verse eight, this persuasion does not come of him that calls you. And so what we see in this passage is what is the real dilemma for the Christian. In reading the Bible, we see the necessity of keeping the law, of doing things that God has ordered us to do. And that's what this Galatian church is wrestling with. And Paul is very clear on dealing with this subject. If we begin at chapter 5 and begin at verse 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Free from what? From the yoke of bondage. He says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You see, Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The yoke is still there and the burden is still there, but it is now easy and light as opposed to being difficult and heavy. And all you have to do to understand that is begin to try to live by the law and you'll feel the weight of the law in your life. And Paul is saying you are not bound to the law, but you have been called into the liberty of the Spirit. Well, what is that liberty? He says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Why would someone be circumcised? Only because they feel that it's necessary for God's acceptance. And that's what these young believers are being taught by these Jewish leaders who have yet to understand the balance between the law and the spirit, between law and grace. Grace doesn't extinguish the law, but there is a proper balance that we must understand and why the law is important to grace and how to exercise our lives within grace and still be obedient to the law. And that can be somewhat difficult to comprehend. And so Paul is trying here to get these young believers to understand just that fact. He continues in verse three and he says, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. In chapter three, verse 10, he says, for as many as are of the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, 
he is guilty of all. And so Paul is saying that it's not only ludicrous to attempt to fulfill the whole law or to keep the whole law, but that it's overbearing. As he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 6, we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, we should now serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so does this mean that we are to strive not to keep the law at all? Well, not too quick, friends. Let's continue to read. He says in chapter 5, verse 4 of Galatians, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now notice here, the key word is justified by the law. In other words, you think that by your keeping the law, doing the things that God wants, you have found favor with him. And the only thing that brings favor to God on our behalf is the Lord Jesus and what he did for us. Because as Isaiah tells us, our most righteous act is as a filthy rag in his sight. And so when we are seen through the person of Jesus by the Father, that is grace, friends. And that's what Paul is trying to say. He continues in verse 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Remember what James says? Faith without works is dead. So works are required here, but you can't put the cart before the horse. Because we have received his mercy and grace, now out of a loving relationship, we desire to bring him pleasure. But we are not to think that we bring him pleasure by performing such works. Does that make any sense? He continues in verse 7, you ran well. When you began in your journey, you ran well. Who has hindered you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion does not come of him, Jesus, that called you. Well, where does it come from? It comes from these Jewish religious leaders who were trying to hold on to the traditions of men as opposed to letting go and living in the liberty of grace. And I would agree with you, that is a very fine line and causes us as much difficulty to understand as it did them. Now notice what Paul says back in chapter 1 of verse 7 of Galatians. He says in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. But then in verse 7 he says, which is really not another. It is the same message as the Old Testament. It's just that the priorities have changed. They've been reversed. Where in the Old Testament, works were required to receive God's favor. Now in the New Testament, because you have received God's favor, works will follow. And this is what apparently has caused confusion in this early fellowship who are striving to be obedient to the things of God. And it says there be some that trouble you. They cause you trouble. They cause you confusion. They're causing turmoil in the fellowship. And what they are doing is they are perverting the gospel of Christ because they are rearranging the priorities. They are placing works in the place of grace. And that perverts the gospel of Christ. So he gives a very strict warning in the next two verses. He says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed or doomed to destruction. And then he repeats it again in verse nine. I say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be doomed to destruction. Why? Because they are altering the message of God. They're changing the words of God. We're all very familiar with Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, which says, I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, speaking very specifically to the book of Revelation, but applying to all of God's word. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. 
But did you know in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse two, it also says, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So we are not to alter the word of God in any way. But the problem is oftentimes we look back on the things that we have done for God and we glory in them. We think that God is pleased by them. And so we begin to place more weight upon what we're doing for the Lord as opposed to what the Lord has done for us. And that's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, he says, we are the circumcision. We worship God in the spirit and we rejoice in Christ Jesus. We take no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And Paul begins to list a number of things that he has done in the name of God and he could take much glory in, but he absolutely refuses to do so. He says in verse five, I have been circumcised the eighth day, which was a custom of the Jew. I am from the stock of Israel. We are Gentiles, most of us. And yet Paul is in the bloodline of Israel. I am from the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, a Pharisee which means that Paul lived within the very strict order of the Pharisee and he kept every observance of the law. You and I can't say that. He says in verse six concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. I thought I was working on behalf of God and so I was eliminating all opposed to the things of God. So I had these Christians jailed, imprisoned, and even put to death. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. Friends, I don't know about you, but I can't say that I've been blameless throughout my life. He says, although all these things were gained to me, I counted them loss for Christ. I count all things for the loss of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ." and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, not standing upon my own good deeds, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so the shift between the law and the spirit, between the law and grace is so subtle, yet it is so vitally important to our lives as followers of the Lord Jesus. So we must understand it's simply that we love God, we seek his will, and we perform his will based upon our love for him. Not in any way to earn his favor, his acceptance, or his approval. And again, I understand that can be difficult to comprehend. Then finally, in verse 10, he says, For do I now persuade men, or do I persuade God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. There are many times that we do things for the appearance of men, but in our hearts, we would rather be somewhere else. We would rather be doing something else. If that's our hearts, friends, then we might as well not even be involved in whatever activity it is that we are doing in the name of God. Because God looks at the heart of men, not our actions. And we do this so that we can receive a pat on the back, an attaboy, that we look good and favorable in the eyes of men. But Paul warns us not to seek to please men, but to seek to please God. And oftentimes, the best way to do this is simply keep it simple. Live a life of prayer live a life of study, and look for every opportunity you can to serve others with a right heart, knowing that you are following the compelling of your heart, which is placed there by the Spirit of the living God, and therefore you are acting upon spiritual impulses that now lead and guide you to the benefit of others, where at one time you were all about yourself only. Are works important? Absolutely but what is the motive of your works? That's the question. If you put the emphasis on the works, 
you fall into the same dangerous position that these early believers in Galatia fell in. But if you understand that your deep love for Christ compels you to put others before yourself and serve them and love them as you do Jesus himself, that, friends, is the message of the gospel. That is where our journey began. And we must be very careful not to be led astray by these misguided teachings that would place more emphasis on the law than they do upon grace. I hope that I haven't confused you this morning. I hope that I've opened your eyes and your minds and helped you better understand what the message of the Lord Jesus is and what it is that Paul is trying to tackle with this young church in Galatia. If you have questions, we still have several chapters in the book of Galatians to discuss, and hopefully we will answer them by the time we get to the end. But if for any reason there's something that has confused you or you would like to discuss, please leave me a question in the comment area below, and I will be sure to answer your question both in writing and possibly on the next video as well. Now, friends, be blessed today. Walk in the Spirit. Be fervent and passionate about your work for the Lord. But most of all, be sure that you're acting on the impulses of the Holy Spirit within you that is leading you and guiding you into the service that you have been called to. Now, I love you, friends. May all you do bring glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as he wills, and until tomorrow, friends, I'll see you on the next video.